and it has stayed with me all these years. And I am going to quote it for you today because it's a very important verse. I'm going to do it out of the King James because that's what I learned it out of the King James. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So important there to understand that God hath raised him from the dead. You see, the resurrection changed everything. It changed earth. It changed heaven. It changed humanity. It changed everything. Because... For thousands of years, ever since Adam, people had been passing from life unto death, life unto death, life unto death. And suddenly, in the midst of history, a man passed from death unto life. The resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now, I want you to understand as well, resurrection is not the same thing as just coming back to life. There were, there were people that Jesus brought back to life. They were revived. Okay. Uh, the young girl who, who had died. And they went in there and Jesus said, well, you know, she's just falling asleep. And they laughed at him because they knew she was dead. But Jesus said to her, little girl, arise. And she did. And Lazarus, who'd been in the tomb for days. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus was revived and brought back to life. But see, that was not resurrection. Resurrection has a whole new meaning to it. Resurrection is not temporary. It's eternal. Those people that were revived that Jesus brought back, eventually they, they died again. But Jesus did not. Jesus did not. And when he was raised from the dead, and I want, I'm, I'm going to go into this further. Because you'll remember that that verse in Romans 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that's so important, and I'll explain why. I'm going to go to the scriptures now. And back in the book of Jeremiah, and I, I mentioned this last Sunday, Jeremiah chapter 31. The scripture says there's a new covenant coming. There's a new covenant. And I'm in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, like the covenant which I made with your fathers in the day, I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their hearts I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see, up to this time, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit of God, was only present in certain individuals, yeah. prophets, priests, and kings, yeah. had the Spirit of God within them. And then at various times, it was not permanent, it was something temporary. The Spirit of God could have been removed. But what he's talking about is a time in the future when the Spirit of Almighty God would inhabit every single one of his people. He said, they're all going to know me. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Jesus came to earth, was born as a human being, one of us, the second person of the Trinity, God in heaven, was born as a baby, as one of us. 
and grew up and lived a human life. In the first and second century, there were many theologians who examined the scriptures and they were looking for doctrinal truth. They were looking for something solid. And in their studies, what they were looking for was how divine was Jesus and how human was Jesus. Was he was he all divine and just part human, or was he all human and just part divine? Or what, what was what was going on there? And there was a terminology that they came up with, and they said he was very God and very man, very God and very man, absolutely, totally, completely divine and absolutely, totally, completely human. Do you think Jesus didn't suffer? when he went to the cross. Oh, yeah. You think he didn't suffer the way a human being suffers knowing what was coming? Oh. Do you know what he said? He said, what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour when it is for this hour that I came. Yes. He said, now is my soul troubled. Now is my soul do you know what that word means in the Greek? That word troubled that, he, that is used there in the original text? It means like a boiling, seething pot. You put a pot on the fire or the water and it boils and boils. He said, that's how my mind is right now. Now is my soul troubled. He was perfectly human, but yet he went to that cross and in going to that cross, his life was given for us. Amen. Because you see, the penalty for sin is death. The penalty for sin is death. That's what God told Adam and Eve. And the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And they did. They died spiritually. It was many years before they died physically. But that day they were separated from God. God came along and said, Did you eat of the tree? Because they were hiding. <laughs> Adam said, the woman that you gave to me, she, she gave me the fruit. And he was trying to pass the thing on. <laughs> she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate of the tree. She gave it to Adam and he ate as well. And God said, what is this? You is this? You see, judgment immediately fell. They got kicked out of the garden, and, and the, the curse of death was upon them. It was from that time on, God said, you know, from dust you came to dust you shall return. And humanity from that day on has been passing from life unto death, life unto death, spiritual life unto spiritual death, physical life unto physical death. And then Jesus came. <laughs> Jesus came. The Son of God and the Son of Man. What does that mean, Son of Man? See, because that's, what, that's how Jesus referred to himself most frequently in the Gospels. For every time he said Son of God, why he said Son of Man probably eight or ten times. That's how he called himself. <laughs> the Greek, from the original text, Son of Man, is huios ek anthropos. Huyos ek anthropos. Son, huyos, of man, anthropos. Huyos, that doesn't just mean somebody who's born in the family. That's a different Greek word. That's technon. Huyos means the full grown, mature, responsible member of the family. That's what that means, huyos. Ek, anthropos, from which we get our English word anthropology which means the study of humanity, and it means all of mankind, all of humanity. So Jesus was referring to himself as the full-grown, responsible member of the entire family of humanity. He was the creator. Did you know that? Read, read John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same as in the beginning with God. By Him were all things made, and without him was not anything made that was made. Right? That's what it said. And there are several other scriptures that refer to Jesus as the active agent of creation. 
It even says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But when he went to that cross, he was huios et patrios, the full-grown, mature, responsible member of all of humanity. And when he died on that cross, he paid the penalty for sin for all of humanity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus explained to his disciples, he said, yeah, I'm going to be turned over to evil men and they're going to give it to the Romans and the Romans are going to crucify me. And then three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And they're going, no, no, why are you going to talk like that? <laughs> because they were expecting him to become the king. We, we talked about that last Sunday. <laughs> talked about how when he rode that donkey into Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king, the king of Israel. They, they wanted him to take the throne get rid of hair, kick out the Romans, you know, restore Israel. That's not why he came. That's not what he was there for at that time. That comes later. He wasn't there to save Israel. He was there to save us. Save us. And he went to that tomb. I bet there's a couple of you don't even know what we're talking about. They went one into a tomb. See, they didn't bury him in the dirt. The custom of the time, the custom of that culture, was that when someone died, there was a tomb that usually belonged to a family. And they would take that person and they would lay them like on a little platform in that tomb and they would leave the body there. And the body would be wrapped and there would be various different herbs and, and different things to sort of hold down the aroma. <laughs> and the body would lay there usually for about a year until all of the flesh was gone, there was nothing left but the bones. And then the family would go back into that tomb, and they would take the bones, and they would wash the bones, and they would put them into a box, about the size of a, of a big uh, ice chest. Okay. And then they would stack that box in the back, there was like a back room to the tomb, and that's where all the boxes were with all of the bones of, of the relatives of the past generations. And so that's what they were going to do with Jesus. They put him in that tomb. And remember the scripture said it was a brand new tomb. Nobody had ever been in there before. That just been cut out. And they put him in there. And they wrapped him up. But they were in a real hurry because sundown was coming. It was the beginning of the Passover. So they had to get out of there quickly. And so the women were going to come back and they were going to put some herbs and so forth with him there and they came back and the tomb had been sealed. There was a stone rolled in front of the door. But that stone was gone and so was Jesus. All that was left was the wrapping. Still laying out there on that platform. And that's where Mary Magdalene was when she went in there and she saw that he was gone. Oh. Now, you know, things couldn't get any worse, could they? <laughs> now the body's gone. And she looks in there and she sees those two individuals in white. Why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? I'm looking for Jesus. And she turned, and there he was. Did she recognize him? No. No. The last time they saw Jesus, he had been beat to a frazzle. <laughs> The scriptures back in Isaiah say that his countenance was more marred than any man. He was beaten to the place to where he was barely recognized. And pierced. And whipped. And there he was standing. She thought he was the gardener. Why are you weeping, woman? Why are you weeping? Well, because my Lord is going, if, if you take him someplace, tell me where it is and I'll go. And then he told her something. He said, you go back and tell the disciples that I'm going to ascend to 
my father and their father. <laughs> and my God, first John. First John. First John chapter three. Beginning with verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Resurrection. Resurrection from the dead. See, when, when we die, when we die here in, in this world, the, the spirit leaves. The book of James says that, the, that just as faith without works is dead, the body without the spirit is dead. Well, where does the spirit go? Well, the word of God says that when you know we die, we go to be with him, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Second Corinthians explains to us that there is actually a spiritual body in heaven that awaits us, so that we are never just you know some little spirit floating around someplace. That there's, that there's actually a body there awaiting us in heaven, and that body in heaven is made to function in heaven the same way that this body here is made to function here. And will be in heaven until the resurrection. And at the resurrection, that's when this body is made like his resurrection body. Okay, you with me? Yes. Incorruptible. <laughs> it will never grow old. It can't be injured. It can't get sick. It, it, it's, it's forever. And it's this body, but it's this body made over wonderful. Wonderful. We knew a couple when we were living up in Wyoming, and uh, this, this, this lady, she was, she always seemed to be having some sort of a diet she was on. She was yeah. always trying to, you know, do something with her weight control. She said, in the resurrection, I want to be a size two. <laughs> yeah. It's this body, it's this body remade. This body remade. Like, the resurrection body of Jesus. And just as this body is made to function here on earth, and that body is made to function there in heaven, the resurrection body can go either place, just like Jesus could go either place. He could function here or he could function there. See? That's what awaits us. That is what we've been given. That is what Jesus was talking about when he said to Mary, huh, it's all changed now, Mary. Tell him I'm going to ascend to my Father and their Father, and my God and their God. Over the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we can, we can read where the people were a little bit puzzled by this. They are saying, you know, when, when, when you rise from the dead, what, what are we going to be like? And that's what the Apostle Paul explains to them, you know, that, that, that new body, that new body is... is not like the one that got married. It's brand new and it's going to be brand new in Jesus. Turn, if you will, back over to Philippians. A little bit of Philippians. Because I want to show you something. Here. Did you ever worry or wonder? Well, you know, so and so. He was cremated and his ashes were scattered. How's he going to be resurrected? Well, you know, there, what about all those people that were buried at sea, you know, and they, what about them? How, how are they going to be resurrected, you know? Well, you know, old so-and-so, he was, he was in the war. And it, I mean, he was blown to pieces. There was nothing left of him. How are they going to be resurrected? I'm going to tell you. God knows every atom, every molecule, every part of you that ever was, 
will be gathered back together and will be that resurrection body. And here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, the Apostle Paul writes for our, our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. How many things? All things. Don't worry about it. He's got it all under control. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly where you are and where you will be then. And we partake of the Christ resurrection. The Christ resurrection becomes our resurrection to dwell with him for eternity. He said, I ascend to my Father, and your God, and my God, and your God. Musicians.
The scripture says that the word of God goes into you as seed and it can grow and it can produce much fruit. And I pray that that is how this word will be to you today. That when you heard that Jesus died for all, if you're a human being, if you're part of that monster post, that includes you. And all you have to do is tell him that you want in. I want in. I want to be part of it. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. Just tell him. He'll hear you. He'll hear you. And he will honor that request. He won't throw you away. He won't push you away. He won't deny what you ask. You ask him to come in. And he'll bring you in. He'll bring you in. So that God will be your Father. Your God, the same as He is, the Father and the God of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, this day, Lord, as we go from this place, may the blessings of Resurrection Sunday remain with us and upon us. Thank you, Lord.